let's get rolling. I want to thank everybody for joining us today uh, for what I think is going to be an amazing program. I'm super excited to have Dave uh, joining us. And uh, and I want to thank all of you for mm-hmm. taking the time out of your day to spend some time with us and, and, uh, and listening in on what Dave has to say. I hope all of you and your families are doing well during this crazy time. I also wanted to say happy uh, Friday. And as a friend of mine who may be listening, sent me a meme that said happy March 97th, because that's kind of what it feels like here. It's just the same thing every day. But um, uh, again, I hope everyone's doing well. I also, of course, want to thank Dave Cooper uh, for giving us his time. He's Dave is doing this um, out of the goodness of his heart. Uh, he's uh, doing this complimentary uh, as a something to give back to the community during these trying times. Um, so here's how today's uh, agenda is going to work. I'm going to introduce Dave. Uh, then we're going to uh, throw up, put up a poll onto the screen that you, we can do through Zoom and you'll all be able to, I'm gonna give everybody about 30 seconds to answer it. It's the only poll question we're going to do, but it should be an interesting way to start off the presentation. Then Dave's gonna speak for about 25 to 30 minutes. And then after that, we'll have a Q&A section. You all can uh, send me your questions at any time during the presentation. I will be looking at the questions, and then I'll, I'll ask Dave the questions uh, and try to get to as many as I've, uh, uh, many of them as I can, uh, depending on how much time we have and how many questions we have. So uh, Dave Cooper, Dave is our speaker today. And Dave, uh, I've known Dave now for a, a couple of years uh, in the capacity as, a, as my executive coach, and he's been just tremendous to work with. Uh, but Dave grew up in Mannheim, Pennsylvania, which is uh, in Lancaster County, Amish country, just about an hour from here, from where I'm sitting right now outside of Philadelphia. Uh, he went on to uh, Bloomsburg University, where he, res- is that right? I got that right, right? Bloomsburg, where he got Adam, a degree. It's in- okay. Was it Juniata? <laughs> Oh, it's no, okay. So I've already screwed this whole thing up. <laughs> Juniata University. I'm really sorry. It's not on his. It's not on your resume. Um, and where he got a degree in molecular biology. And then after graduating from school, Dave joined the Navy specifically uh, with the desire to become a Navy SEAL. Uh, they Dave Jen became a Navy SEAL, where he had a 25 year career, 19 of which were spent as a member of what's called the Naval Special Warfare Development Group also known to us lay people as SEAL Team 6. During his career, he was in Desert Storm, Desert Shield, and numerous, uh, and and participated in dozens and dozens of missions in all kinds of places we can only imagine, um, such as Haiti, Bosnia, Somalia, Yemen, Afghanistan, Iraq, and on and on and on. Um, Most notably, I think, Dave was uh, instrumental in the preparation, the uh, planning, the the planning, the preparation, and the execution of the mission that ultimately resulted in the death of Osama bin Laden. Uh, After Dave left the Navy, which was in 2011, right, Dave? Is that correct? Um, He received a a master's from Oxford University in, and I had to write this down, complexity science and social psychology. So Dave brings a very unique skill set to this topic. Uh, Dave now spends his time as a consultant and a coach. He consults with some of the largest companies uh, in in the world, uh, as well as smaller companies, uh, governmental agencies, as well as professional sports teams. So a a wide range of of organizations that Dave works with, as well as sitting on the board of a number of organizations. And, and again, it's been my great pleasure to work with Dave over the, over the past couple of years. One other thing I do want to mention that I think is very uh, interesting and, and um, uh, germane to this topic, which is that Dave, uh, well, Dave is uh, the, the father of three boys, um, and his wife, Sonia, is the, and I had to write this down as well, the vice president and chief nursing officer at Centara Princess Anne Hospital in uh, Virginia Beach, which is where Dave and his family live. So. Uh, as Dave and I were discussing not long ago, Dave spent the majority of his career going off to the uh, front lines while leaving his wife home with their three children. And now because of the pandemic that we're in, it's a reversal of roles. Dave's wife is going off to the hospital every day to the front lines to try and help in this crisis while Dave has to stay home, not has to, Dave does stay home with his children 
and uh, and works from there. So it's an uh, interesting role reversal, and I think it's these unique skill sets that really make Dave uh, the right person to talk about how to deal with stress and anxiety during this pandemic. So, Dave, take it away. I'm going to put up the poll now, but then I'm going to ask okay. you to take it away, all right? And okay, I'm going to turn over good. the reins to you in one second. So I'm launching okay. the poll. Yeah. Everyone's got 30 seconds. The clock is running. Oh, yes, it's so cool. People are starting to answer. I love this. This is wild. Can you see the results, Dave? Are you able I to can't see, see I can't see the okay. results, but I can see the question. I, shows, I, I assume as soon as I end, end the poll yeah. that, uh, okay, so I'll give you five more seconds. <clears throat> And stop. And I'm going to share the results. Can everyone see that now? Oh, wow, yeah. There we go. Fascinating. So I'll leave that up there for a moment. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Dave. Take it away. Okay. So hi there. I'm going to try and share my screen. Uh, we'll see how this works. And we're going to try and have some fun with, uh, you know, getting to know stress and anxiety, which is the purpose for our all uh, for all of us coming here today. And I think of anything, uh, the quote at the bottom by William James kind of sums things up. The great thing then in all education is to make our nervous system our ally instead of our enemy. Uh, and that's really the gist of what I'm about to talk about. And I will tell you straight up that, that there are obviously exceptions to that. Well, we, we can't make our, our nervous system our, our ally, but uh, there is much that we can do. And uh, to, you know, to, to, in all frankness, right, we want to get to the Q&A, so I will move through this pretty quickly, uh, but as things pop up, you can certainly, you know, jot your questions uh, down in the, in the chat section or the Q&A section, uh, and, and Chad will see those. So without further ado, we're going to start with anxiety first, even though stress is, uh, you know, tends to, ooh, come on, talk to me here. Stress comes first. There we go. One of the things I think to consider uh, in all of this is that anxiety is a, is a normal, healthy emotion. Um, it, it allows us to, uh, you know, it's kind of been handed down to us by evolution, if you will, and that if things are out of place or amiss, uh, it's the one thing that drives us to take action. And if you look at this in the, particularly the, uh, uh, you know, what we're doing now in the, in the age of COVID, uh, you know, this is helpful. This anxiety motivates our hand washing. It motivates the social, social distancing, um, less touching of the face, the using sanitizers and stuff like that. It even motivates us to uh, adults to give and receive feedback. We don't particularly care to give and receive feedback. It's sometimes, you know, uh, it's just uncomfortable, right? But now is such a time where you see people, uh, giving feedback where they might not have had the courage to do so otherwise. We had, you know, the, the Uber Eats guy show up at our house the other night when we ordered out and uh, came up to the door as I was coming to the door and he put up his hand and said, do not come out. That's a form of feedback that he might not have said at, at any other time uh, in this. And you'll even see this. I got to amuse myself. But uh, uh, even Winnie the Pooh is... Uh, has been moved by the times and he's given Piglet some much needed feedback here, Piglet back uh, up. I have for the children, you know, blanked out the expletive and you'll, you'll, you'll forgive me for trying to amuse myself. One of the things we want to talk about though is uh, obviously, and I mentioned this before, anxiety at times can reach some, un, some unhealthy levels. Anxiety is typically an, an internal response. Stress is, uh, uh, we'll talk about in a, in a few minutes, stress is that reaction to an external threat. Anxiety is our internal response to that stress. It can reach some unhealthy levels, particularly when we uh, uh, have anxiety in the absence of any threat. I watched my eight-year-old today. Um, you know, he believes that there are humans. That's how he refers to them living under his bed. Uh, it makes him anxious. I can tell you that there are no humans living under his bed, right? Uh, that those are things that can grip us all uh, or when our anxiety is out of proportion to what is actually going on in the world. This feeling of anxiety is something that makes us feel out of control. It's erratic. We think that, uh, you know, it, uh, as I said, it, it, it tends to uh, send us spinning off and that's what has this 
you know, kind of erratic feel to it, but it's actually very systemic. It works in a particular way. We can see it coming on and there are things we can do to actually take advantage of that and ameliorate some of those, those things. First, anxiety is one of those things we feel in our body. It's not like joy. Joy, you don't necessarily feel viscerally. Anxiety, we do. Uh, that's what tends to make us feel out of control. There are some steps we can take, though, to lessen that and, and restore this sense of autonomy. I prefer that word to control, but it's they're, they're synonyms, if you will. So to restore that sense of autonomy and order. Uh, first is understanding how it happens. So we initially, uh, when we become anxious, the first thing is that stress response. Something causes us um, to you know, pick up our breathing rate and our heart rate. And we would know that as the fight or flight response, right? But there is a decision point in there. This is step two, when, they, when we decide either consciously or unconsciously that uh, what we're experiencing is out of the norm and it makes us anxious. And in other words, when we exercise, our heart rate goes up, our breathing rate goes up, uh, but we don't feel this sense of anxiety. And it's that feeling then uh, that if we don't do something that can lead to what we call a positive feedback loop, where that anxiety creates more of a stress response, creates more anxiety, creates more of a stress response, and that can feel uh, like we're moving out of control then, and it becomes systemic. So some of the things we can do, and these are tactics, if you will. The first uh, you know, thing out there is that we can breathe, right? And, and believe it or not, we have... Um, stretch receptors in our lungs, in our stomachs, in our intestines, in our gut, if you will. And when we fill our lungs with air, it activates those stretch receptors. And that sends a signal back to the brain that says, hey, you know, things aren't quite as bad as you're making them out to be. And you can stop sending the signals out to speed up our heart rate and, and our, uh, our breathing rate. Uh, box breathing is a, is a technique that we use. There are several out there. This is a common one. It's, uh, you know, it's, it, uh, as you can read right there, we inhale for four seconds, we hold our breath for four seconds, we exhale for four seconds, and then we sit with kind of an empty tank for four seconds before we repeat. And if you do that four or five times, two things you've done. One, your mind is on your breathing. It's not what's on making you anxious. Secondly, that's actually changing your blood chemistry. And we're kind of telling the sympathetic nervous system to be quiet. That's the, that's the part of the nervous system that gets us all fired up. And we're telling the parasympathetic nervous system to kind of take over. And that's the side of the nervous system that kind of will settle us down, if you will. So breathing is one. <clears throat> we can also reframe anxiety. Doesn't necessarily mean we can do this in the time of COVID, but in general, uh, we can reframe those feelings that we're having. We might be excited. Uh, you might ask yourself, hey, you know, maybe I'm energized. I'm not necessarily anxious in a bad way. I'm energized. You're looking forward to something or anticipating something that's going to happen later on in the day or in the week, and you're feeling it now, and it might be that, that uh, sense of anticipation that's making you anxious. Or for those of you out there who, uh, you know, still compete, or if you have to get up and speak in front of groups, it could be your body's way of telling you that you're, you know, we're ready to to go. You're primed to perform, as we say. And you know, I see this in my again in my youngest son. I'll use him as an example again. Uh, before his swim meets, he he will say, "Hey, I'm nervous." And even he knows now when he says that. I say, "What does that mean?" He said, "Well, I guess it means my body's ready to go." And so it is. And that's you know an, an, another way to reframe this that might allow us to uh, lessen the the effects of that anxiety, if you will. Then we can also, in the end, we can dispute it or we can combat it. This is the ABCs of, you know, this is what you would see in cognitive behavioral therapy and stuff like that. A is the activating event. B is a belief that we have in that event. And those beliefs tend to trigger emotional consequences like anxiety. Uh, so it's in cases like this that we can say, hey, you know, uh, we kind of reframe it saying, hey, I've been through tough times before. Uh, maybe this isn't going to be as bad as I'm making out to be. Or in other cases, we can reframe in a sense of, uh, you know, hey, there might be some opportunity here. So trying to reframe it uh, is sometimes helpful. When we do that, though, we're going to step into those situations. We have to give ourselves permission to not be perfect, as I write here, you know, give yourself permission to suck. Uh, perfection is not part of the equation in any of this. Uh, elegance is not part of the equation. Um, weathering it is part of the equation. One of the things we do in circumstances that uh, cause us to become anxious is that we overestimate the danger and we underestimate our ability to, to kind of uh, handle that danger, if you will, or handle the things that come our way. Um, 
and that's important to keep in mind, right? Uh, I don't want to say that you know it, it, that we're overestimating the COVID danger or anything like that. More in a general sense, um, you know, this is catastrophic thinking, and people will say, "Hey, the world's coming to an end." We need to step back and say, "Hey, maybe it isn't," and we do have a lot of things that we can do. Uh, to handle some of these things that are thrown our way. There is an exact opposite to this. When other people are feeling a little bit anxious and there's that one person in the crowd that's saying, uh, that's feeling no anxiety, who underestimates the danger and overestimates their ability to handle, that's what we call an, uh, an optimism bias. It could be a host of other things as well. But in general, that's an optimism bias. And that's kind of a sense that bad things happen to other people and they don't happen to me. Obviously, that's not healthy. But in general, right? Don't overestimate the danger. Don't underestimate your ability to, to handle that. Let's switch to stress, right? As I said, stress is that response to an external threat in the environment. So stress is external, anxiety is internal. Again, like, uh, like anxiety, it is completely normal. Some stress, you know, if you lift weights or you exercise, that uh, uh, modicum of stress can actually make you stronger. And it generally occurs whenever we need to adapt, whenever there's a novel situation or there are changes in the environment or a perceived need to change, that will elicit that stress response. More specifically, right, when we, um, when our resources are threatened, and there are so many things that we can count as resources, time and money are certainly two that are easy to think about. But when that resource, let's say you know, your, your, your time is threatened, uh, we humans don't like to lose things. We feel those twice as much as we do a gain. So if I, you know, I say, hey, I, you have a $10 bill and I threaten you with taking that, you'd feel that much more than if I, you know, uh, the prospect of gaining $10, if you will. Secondly, when we lose those resources, not just threaten them, but I take that $10 from you, we tend to feel those things. We are very sensitive to negative information in the environment. And third, when we put in a lot of time and effort into something and we're not getting that return on investment, this is another way in which that that stress response is uh, is enacted. So, if we look at uh, the impacts to well-being in the age of, of this virus, all of these things you can see on the screen here are, in a sense, resources. Our sense of identity is a resource. Our sense of self-esteem is a resource. Our connections and social network, our income, our sense of control or autonomy, and that sense of support that we have, which is closely connected to that notion of that social network. If I were to tick off just one of those and threaten your sense of self-esteem, that can cause you to, to that stress response to, to be enacted. What COVID is doing is ticking off all of these boxes at once, right? With this, and that can cause this sense of stress to be overwhelming. Obviously, what results from that is a sense of anxiety that can be overwhelming as well. In my world, in the world of complexity science or complexity theory, we refer to this as tuna. It's not just what's for dinner, right? It's uh, T is turbulence, U is uncertainty, N is novelty, and A is ambiguity. So situations that are turbulent, uncertain, novel, and ambiguous, any one of these can cause us to feel stressed. Again, what is this virus doing? It's, it's ticking off all of these boxes at once. And again, that can cause us to be overwhelmed. And obviously stress like anxiety can reach levels that aren't healthy as well. And that's chronic stress and trauma. Those are not the things I'm gonna talk about today. I am gonna talk about, uh, you know, as I talked about with anxiety, some of the tactics we can use to, 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 uh, to mitigate that stress. I show you this slide not because I want you to read it or understand what any of those words mean, but to just to, as a sense to say that there, uh, there are times when I don't care how much breathing you do. You could be Mother Teresa or the Dalai Lama, you know, people that, you know, obviously Mother Teresa no longer with us, but uh, she and the Dalai Lama meditated for hours and hours and hours a day. Lovely practice. I recommend it. Most of us don't have four hours a day to meditate, but I don't even care how great you are at that process. Uh, 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 mindfulness, there are things uh, that go on, those complex interactions between the environment and our genes that, uh, you know, put us on a trajectory that, that no amount of coping or um, these, these uh, mitigating tactics will ameliorate or lessen, right? And that's when people really need to seek professional help. And sometimes that professional help requires uh, uh, medications as well. I just wanna throw that up there to say, hey, this is it. And I don't wanna uh, make light of these things and say, hey, stress and anxiety are things that we can just uh, take care of on our own. Some we can, and we're gonna look at what some of those are. These are stress sources and some of the things that we can do, again, to reduce the source of stress, and they kind of go in an uh, ascending order. If you look at um, um, you know, daily hassles, what are daily hassles? Well, they could be anything. Uh, it could be traffic, it's the kids, it's emails. 
Uh, it's the conspiracy theorists in your family, like we have in ours. My sister, lover to death, is a math- mathematician that believes everything she reads. So she's a she's a daily challenge uh, for some people. Brushing your teeth is a daily hassle because it takes time away from what it is they're trying to do. These things, in and of themselves, you know, one one of those things might not be that much stress, but they add up, right? So what we want to do is not minimize them. Uh, and just say, oh, it's just, you know, it's just, it's just my sister again. Uh, We don't want to give ourselves a hard time over and say, well, it's just a traffic. I shouldn't be getting up so upset. What happens obviously is that these little stressors add up to a lot of stress. And what they do then is take away energy, that resource that we need to deal with some of the big stressors that are out there. Uh, You can do as Teddy Roosevelt suggests here, do what you can with what you've got, where you are, right? Breathe. It's always something we can come back to, at least in the short term. Stepping up a notch from that is decision-making fatigue, or as we sometimes just shorten it to decision fatigue. So this is tricky. This is what happens, not for everybody, um, but it happens during critical periods like we're in right now. There's been some trigger, the virus, if you will, and we have this period where there's a lot of turbulence and uncertainty and all that tuna stuff that I talked about. And we're having to make decisions much more often, you know, sometimes in the, in the, we make more decisions in a single day than we would in a single month. I look at my wife, who's a healthcare exec, making more decisions in her 12 to 15 hour days uh, than she would have had to make uh, in an entire month. What happens that we're expending energy as we're doing this, right? So we grow tired throughout the day, that fatigue, uh, can also initiate a stress response. And what happens is those, the, the quality of those decisions we're making uh, becomes poorer and poorer, which also uh, feeds back into that stress response again. And here we go off on that, that um, feedback loop. What are some of the answers to this? Well, for one, when these events come along like this, they, they kind of destroy our old routines. Routines are a way of, of taking decision-making out of the process. We all have a routine in the morning, we have whatever it might be. We get up, we have a cup of coffee, we take a shower, we get dressed, we go to work, right? We don't have to think about that stuff. So when an event like this happens, uh, one of the ways to lessen the effects of that stress is to find new routines, even simple ones. You know, when this six weeks ago when we were, the governor of Virginia said, Hey, uh, uh, we're shutting down schools. Well, that was, you know, from my wife and I, there goes our routine. Kids think it's great because the summer break starts early, but, uh, you know, for us, it was stressful. So we said, Hey, we need a new routine and we need one fast. And, and, and we, we started that with, you know, nine o'clock school starts, uh, kids go till about two o'clock. And then after that, we try and get outside and get a workout in or something like that. But that routine has taken at least some decision-making out of the process. It allows us to hang on to some of that energy or time or other resources that we can then feed back into uh, what some of the more challenging stressors are. And this one is with the ongoing uncertainty, which at this, you know, at this stage for some people, this has become chronic. What do you do uh, with all of this uncertainty? Uh, again, there's no perfect answer. You know, you have to give yourself permission to not be perfect. But what, one, of the, uh, one of the things we can do is separate our problems into two, two groups. One of those that we can control Right, and those problems are now where we we need to generate and test solutions in this new environment. We need to leverage that network of friends and colleagues and ask them, hey, what are you doing? And see if we can extract some of those best practices. And in the end, this means we we have to get creative. And that other pot, if you will, is this um, notion of those those problems that you can't control. And then we have to practice acceptance. Um, Breathe, obviously. Uh, but at some level, we practice acceptance. One of the interesting things, though, is that, you know, in my career, you know, when we had, uh, you know, in the early 2000s, you know, well, we were also conducting operations in Afghanistan. We were also pursuing war criminals across Eastern Europe. And um, one of these heinous guy, he was named Miroslav Duranyic. He uh, was responsible for something called the Massacre of Srebrenica. Uh, he orchestrated the, the massacre of 8,000 Muslim men, women, and children, mostly men and boys. So it's a guy, you know, he makes Bin Laden look like a Boy Scout. Well, we had given, uh, been given the, 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 uh, the order, if you will, to go find this guy. We went undercover in Eastern Europe. We had about two months to find him before his indictment would become open to the public. He knew he was being pursued. Uh, he just didn't know for sure. But once that indictment becomes public, we'd never see the guy again. 
So two months, we're undercover trying to find him. We are just a few days away from the indictment becoming open. We've tried everything we can to find this guy. We've gathered lots of information. Uh, we have, uh, you know, suffered ind indignations, you know, living in a, a ethnically cleansed town, um, getting thrown up against the wall, searched by police. He'd been a mayor of this town. The police were in his back pocket still. He was coming back into that town to visit family. Uh, and two days before it was all to end, I called the team aside and said, hey, look, I put us in in group two. We've done everything we can do. At this point, there's nothing more we can do. We've given it the old college try. Be proud of yourselves and for the effort that you put into this, but it's not going to happen this time around. We're not going to succeed. We're going to fail. And it's about the time I finished running my mouth, the youngest guy in the team put up his hand and said, hey, I have an idea. Uh, and his idea was to uh, use a kind of surveillance that we didn't think was possible. Uh, it was putting a human in a place where we normally put cameras and my first thought was, well, that's never going to work. But my second thought was, well, let's ask the rest of the group. There were eight of us. I put the question to the other six guys and, and they said, hey, what do we have to lose? My point there is, you know, we did what he suggested. Uh, within six hours, we located a car that had been attached to that guy. We followed that car and it led us to this guy. And, and you know, he spent the rest of his life in the hate. My point is, Sometimes we put those things in group two when there are other people in our network that can help them dr help us drag those problems back into group one. Uh, and it's similar too with the, you know, with the breathing that I mentioned earlier, right? You know, every time I, I lined up on a door, Afghanistan, Iraq, Yemen, Somalia, you name it, right? In the middle of the night with Dave and his teammates on one side of the door uh, and, and the bin Ladens of the world on the other side of the door, my practice and many of my teammates have the same practice of, uh, was to take one big deep breath, get it all in, right? <sighs> And let it go. And whatever happens on the other side of the door is going to happen, right? We we knew our level of mastery. That's important. I'll touch on that later. And then we go through the door. So my point here is that practices like breathing work and and uh, separating our problems into into groups that we control and can't control also work as well. But our friends can also, as I said, help us uh, perhaps transport some of those problems from group two back into group one. <clears throat> so. Those are tactics. Uh, so there are some overarching strategies that we can use. These are called coping strategies. Um, you know, to some extent, how well we cope uh, with what's going on depends on, on, on uh, you know, how well we get through this uh, uh, current crisis, if you will. There are certainly negative coping strategies, and you can see here, retreat, abuse, harm, and mistreat. So we retreat emotionally and physically from the people that matter to us. We abuse substances because it numbs us. Uh, we can harm ourselves in any number of different ways, and we can mistreat others. And I, you know, this is the old story of you have a bad day at work, you come home and kick the dog. We still don't understand why this is, but kicking the dog can relieve stress. The problem is, and of course, there's worse than kicking the dog. The problem is it creates more problems beyond that, right? Uh, you know, and, and we can all envision what those might be. Um, so what are the positive coping strategies that we can use? And as you can imagine, these coping strategies are going to be the exact opposite of those negative ones. However, there's some themes that I want to throw in there. Routines again. How can we take these coping strategies that I'm going to talk about and build them into new routines, even simple ones? A variety is important, right? Uh, if you have just one coping strategy and that's taken away from you, well, that's going to elevate your stress level. So how can we have more than one of these coping strategies to make them work together? Mastery is a resource of ours that can help us reduce stress and anxiety. Uh, it's, the, it's the things we're good at and the things we like doing. Now, if it's work and work is taken away from us, then we're going to have to find mastery elsewhere. Perhaps it's in a hobby that we like to do or something like that. And in addition to that, we can learn new things. We can develop mastery in other areas. All of these things, again, helping us to reduce stress uh, and anxiety. So first and foremost, social connections. You know, humans are social animals, right? We need to stay connected, however that might be. If it's only virtually, if it's only at a distance of six feet or two meters, However, that might be my, you know, my neighborhood a couple of weeks ago, I started off the Zoom happy hour on Saturdays. Uh, I intended it for a happy hour. The first one went four and a half hours and most of the other ones back, uh, since then, the two others have gone almost three hours. So you people, you know, are craving this kind of connection. So we have to stay connected. The thing with social media, as you see here, is if you're using it to connect to people that can enhance your sense of well-being. But there's the dark side of, of social media as well, and that's the misinformation, the disinformation, where people are actively and 
uh, and knowingly putting up fake information and the divisiveness. Those things do nothing to help us uh, mitigate the effects of stress. So we want to recognize those sensational headlines, get rid of them, double check your sources of information before you start to act on that or allow that to form how you uh, uh, how you feel about the world, right? Check those sources and curate your own platforms. If people are using Facebook, instead of reading some of the divisive, uh, angry stuff out there, they'll use it to, to look at pictures and, uh, and stay connected to friends and stuff like that. Go for the positive stuff, try and push the negative and neutral stuff off to the side. So social connection is, is huge in that regard. Joyful distractions, here's where mastery comes into play. Um, you know, if, or if, if you've never learned to play the guitar and now's a perfect time to be, to become, a, a you know, a master in the, in the, in the time that we have, but it could be anything It's joyful distractions. What are the things you like to do and that you enjoy or that you're good at doing? Listening to the music, playing music, going outside, going for a walk. You can go for a 10 minute vigorous walk and that's going to give you a two hour boost of, of, uh, of energy and a, and a sense of feeling better about the world. Might not be perfect again, but feeling better. And plan these things into your day. Paul Haru, who's um, you know, an old Bosque philosopher said, there is no trouble so great or grave that cannot be much diminished by a nice cup of tea. If that works for you, plan that into your day. And as I, and as I said before, uh, now's the time to learn new things as well. Right? Self-care is huge. We all know this, exercise, eat better, sleep better, get outside more, breathe better. And the last one is perhaps the most important one there is share the load, right? When we feel stressed, we feel stressed, right? We, we tend to think that it's on our shoulders. That should be a trigger to say, hey, I need to share this, whether it's with teammates at work or family members or, or colleagues, whatever the case might be. Don't shoulder it all on your own. Try and share it as much as you possibly can. And then last but not least is helping others. This isn't, uh, you know, helping others isn't necessarily something that's purely altruistic. We feel better. We get a little shot of dopamine uh, when we help others. So practice kindness because it's going to help you to feel better. And I encourage people always to ask what you can do, ask what we can do as a group, whether that's your family or your community, or ask what your organization can do as, as, as Chad and company are doing here and trying to share this with all of you. Uh, some, some, Tips, though, when we're, we're uh, trying to help others, this is the time for full-on empathy. So in other words, you want to be the VP of listening, right? You want to sit with somebody else's discomfort. You can say things like, hey, this stinks. You were robbed. I'm really sorry this has happened to you. You think of the, you know, the, the kids who aren't going to be able to graduate, uh, whether it's from university or, or high schools, right? Um, and we can say that, and then we can steer them towards some of these positive coping strategies. What we don't necessarily want to do, even though we're intending to help, is say things like, hey, look at the bright side, at least you're not dead, or you don't live in Afghanistan, uh, or, or you know, some other third world country. That's what we call down comparing, and look how bad those people have it, and you should stop crying. Our intention is there, but these things don't necessarily help us uh, uh, mitigate the effects of stress. Stick with sitting with the discomfort, and then steering people towards those uh, you know, positive coping mechanisms. If you know somebody that's uh, uh, using negative coping strategies, recognize one thing, at least they're trying to cope. And then you can say, hey, I get it. You like you know, watch Netflix in a dark room with a bottle of vodka because uh, it makes you feel better. But you know, in the long run, that might not be the best thing to do. And what are some of these other coping strategies that we you know, can perhaps uh, enlist to help us get through this? And don't expect people to say, hey, you're right. Perfect. Right. Let's do that. Uh, change doesn't work that way in individuals or in organizations. They might fight you and you can leave people with, hey, I'm, I'm not saying you need to do this, but I, I just ask you to think about it and let them run it over. And, and there's a good chance that people will come back to you and say, hey, I think you're right. Um, if that doesn't work and none of that works, of course, then is the time when we need to really seek professional help. And there are obviously resources out there to do that. So the bottom line on this, you know, when we think about coping, and I got to put it in a way that is easy for us to remember, perhaps that's connect to others, distract ourselves as those joyful distractions, care for self and care for others. So connect, distract, care, and care. Understand, again, there are no elegant solutions to this. Uh, and if you focus on nothing else, uh, focus on the positive coping strategies that I talked about. And last but not least, because resiliency kind of uh, doesn't kind of it, you know, it, it, it butts up against this stuff, right? Uh, it's very similar to, to what goes on uh, as a result of stress and anxiety. Often we think of resiliency as our ability to bounce back. That's true. But it's also our ability to reinvent ourselves, sometimes just a little, sometimes a lot. Resiliency is mostly about coping. Uh, to some extent, the better we cope, uh, the more resilient we're going to be. It's a sense of uh, 
as I, I mentioned earlier, we, we uh, can weather the storm. We might, might not like it, but we can weather it and we can also learn from it. Again, there's a recognition that there's much beyond our control. Got it. That's that group two kind of uh, those problems, but there is much within our power as well. So these positive coping strategies, those tactics that I mentioned, and I'm always reminded that all of these, whether it's the tactics I mentioned or the strategies I mentioned, these things are amplified when we come together as groups. This is where my area of expertise, if you will, uh, when we do this with teams and organizations, right? Uh, coping with stress and anxiety uh, is no different. The process is no different, whether we're individuals or we're talking about an organization. It looks different at different levels, but the uh, the the patterns are very similar. And I'm reminded here of Apollo 13. It's a great example of this. If you recall, it's, uh, you know, when the astronauts were headed to the moon, there was an explosion and it didn't look like they were going to be able to get the astronauts home. And, uh, you know, for 55 hours, I believe it was, they had those four teams in mission control along with the astronauts trying to figure this problem out. And at the end they did, those astronauts were returned safely. And what one of the uh, team members in mission control said afterwards, and this spells it out, we were greater than the sum of our parts. So that ability to cope and manage stress and anxiety uh, can be amplified if we come together to do it as a, as a group and as a team. And lastly, as I, as I said, uh, positive coping, positive coping, positive coping. And that's the end of that. And what I'm going to do is uh, stop sharing. Chad, are you still the host? Um, I think I turned it over to you. Maybe you could give it okay. back to me, although it doesn't matter, I don't think, at this point. Uh, I do have quite a few questions that have been sent in. And oh, right now, good. by the way, please. Hopefully I can answer them. I'm sure you can, or you can make it up. Either one would be fine. But um, no. uh, I think these are right up your alley. And uh, first of all, thank you for the, your remarks. Uh, and your presentation, terrific, yeah. really great stuff. A lot of, I think- I was moving stuff. fast. Yeah, we're moving fast, that's okay. And it, it uh, I think it was a, uh, a good pace and allowed people to really get some good skills, hopefully that they can use. Um, and a lot of our questions are sort of related uh, to, um, to, the, to, to what you were talking about, but there are a number of questions that are, that are sort of the, the same question asked several different times. So. I'm going to just read this one, which was, as businesses are looking to reopen, what is the best way to convey and relate anxiety to your peers and to your employer? Um, if you have folks uh, who are pretending that they feel okay, but uh, are clearly in some kind of internal tor turmoil, uh, how, do you, how do you help them out in this sort of fake it till you make it world? What's the, what's the best way to to, to help people through this. And we, get, we had a very similar question, which was for people who are experiencing tremendous <clears throat> anxiety, but they can't actually even pinpoint what their anxiety is, besides the fact that we've got this pandemic, which is right. a bit more, I say a more general thing. Uh, how do you help those folks out? There is no best way. Uh, that's why I said we have to take perfection out of the equation in times like this. And we talk about, uh, you know, in, in, in complex times, we talk about clumsy solutions, not elegant solutions. Uh, and that's where you need to test and generate different solutions. So try things out. I will tell you this, I, you know, my neighbor is a dentist, uh, owns her own practice. And, um, you know, just they were shut down and they, they had a meeting yesterday with their managers, the, mostly the, the, the office manager and the, the head hygienist, if you will, uh, about, you know, coming back to work. Um, her, my neighbor's senior partner, the guy that started the practice is, you know, a dentist is in his mid sixties. He doesn't seem to think that it's a big deal uh, and that they can come back to work right now. And of course that's, you know, working inside the mouths of, uh, of, of people who could be asymptomatic. Right. So this was really generating a lot of stress and anxiety and she didn't necessarily know what to do. And I said, Hey, I don't necessarily know what to do either, but I would tell you to listen and go to that meeting and see what, uh, you know, your, your hygienists have to say. And, you know, one of them started crying and said, Hey, you know, you got people up the street at the hospital that are putting on these full suits just to swab people. And you want us to come in and work in people's mouths with, with devices that, that aerosolize, uh, bacteria inside the mouth. And we're going to do it with just a mask on and stuff like that. And, and she said, I, I don't think I can ask my, my teammates to come back to work. And when you hear that, it wasn't so much my neighbor hearing that, but it was her senior partner going, you know, holy cow, I, I didn't 
think of it that way. So there's a bit of lit listening that needs to go on and, and a lot of empathy that needs to go on. But then there's also getting creative and saying, you know, hey, small businesses are going to be hit hard by this. I don't think we recognize how hard uh, yet. And um, and there's bringing people together and saying, hey, you know, uh, at some point, do we say, hey, we can clean your teeth? Going back to the dentistry example, but it's not going to be like it used to be for a little while. It's going to be the old fashioned way. We scrape things off and we brush things and floss things and we send you on your way with some x-rays and, and stuff like that. And if we have to get into the full kit uh, to do some kind of uh, invasive procedure, then perhaps that's way. But again, that's inviting people in. This is this notion of, of active participation that helps people ready themselves and everybody else for change. But again, no perfect way. Uh, listen, practice empathy, and draw people in when it's time to do some of these things that are going to require change again. The more you can involve people, uh, the more likely you are to get some interesting solutions come out of that. Yeah, uh, you know, there's a, a, a follow-up question because it's very related that we, we received, which was how do you, and I guess this relates to your friend, the dentist, is how do you get people, how do you deal with people who don't take COVID seriously? And I guess it's an interesting question because everybody has their, everybody thinks they're taking it as seriously as it should be, right? Everybody has a different notion of what's considered serious. But if somebody's not taking it as seriously, and we can see lots of examples of that on the news, how do you convey um, that to them without, I guess, causing too much conflict, right? Yeah, uh, well, we, you know, conflict for us is, is productive if you do it properly. Um, I'll give you a, a, an example. One of my son's basketball teams, my 12-year-old is going to play in the NBA, if you ask him. Um, I, I have yet to remind him that his dad has a six inch vertical leap and he'll likely have a six inch vertical leap as well. But his basketball team is a very good basketball team. Uh, the coach says, well, we're still going to have practices. And my wife, you know, the VP of a hospital said, Hey, that's not happening. Uh, you can have the practice if you wish. Here are the things I would, I would be concerned about. I will share this with the other parents as well. And my son's not coming to practice. So that's a kind of feedback there that I mentioned earlier where, you know, if somebody isn't taking it as seriously as you are, that's where you say, you know, the, the, the Uber Eats drivers, I'm walking to the door. I didn't really have the intention of stepping out onto the uh, the, the patio there to meet him, but he gave me that feedback. Hey, stay inside. Um, uh, and that's something you have to do. Hey, I respect your opinions. Uh, I would appreciate if you respect mine as well and keep your distance, you know, like Winnie the Frank Pooh. about it, like Winnie the Pooh. You can even use Winnie exactly. the Pooh's language, right? Yeah. Um, I, can you speak briefly to cortisol levels? This is obviously something you're familiar with and study due to prolonged stress and the effect of the long-term release that we might expect <clears throat> we're all dealing with this long-term sustained, sustained stress levels. It's not a quick, short, you know, burst of stress because somebody yelled boo. We're dealing with this on a very, very long-term basis. And what do you think might be the long-term result of that? It, well, the long-term result is not good. I, and whoever asked that question, I think is probably well, well aware of that. And that's when, you know, this is, this is this hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, right? You got the one part of the brain to another part of the brain to tell another part of the body to start cranking out cortisol. Uh, and sometimes it doesn't shut off properly. And those prolonged uh, exposure to cortisol is just, it's just not good. That's when you need to go see somebody, uh, an actual specialist that can, uh, help with medications to reduce that and don't wait. Uh, you know, if you, this is a tough thing for people to do, but if you suspect that kind of chronic stress level, here's the time, just like, uh, COVID patients are being put on ventilators. Here's the time we're all, we, we might need a little ventilator help ourselves, right? Something to help us get through this so we can, when we can start breathing on our own again, we can get back to whatever normal is going to be. But uh, cortisol is, uh, you know, the, those in increased levels over a long period of time are just so, uh, have such negative effects on our health and well being. And that's time. And you must see this with soldiers on a regular basis, right? I mean, they're, because they're under a heightened level of stress potentially for, you know, when they're deployed for quite a while. And, and, and maybe is that what results in the PTSD that many of them experience when they come back? world is multiply caused. There's a number of things that could lead down the track to, to post-traumatic stress. Um, and again, mastery has a, plays a big role here. So you look at, and choice plays a big role here. So you look at the guys like me who, uh, 
uh, we're given the best training in the world, the best equipment in the world, work with some of the best uh, operators in the world. And we chose the missions we decided to go on. Uh, even the Bin Laden mission, we chose the time so and the day. So these other soldiers, uh, and I've you know, rolled into Fallujah with these young Marines who had no say in what they were uh, going to do. And they, you know, drove around and, you know, they, they get shot and blown up. Uh, and, and certainly uh, you see a sense sometimes of learned helplessness going on there. It's another effect of long-term stress is that uh, this is the role where one might have been the optimist, one becomes the pessimist. There's nothing I can do here. Um, um, and, and I'm, you know, learned helplessness. I, all I can do is crawl up in a ball and, and wait for this to end. Again, that's, that's a time where we, we need help. So choice matters, mastery matters, uh, failing those things, the network that we belong and we can do and we can share these things. Uh, um, most of us got to get over that hurdle of expressing a vulnerability. But if you do, I, I guarantee you for leaders as well inside of organizations, uh, you're going to find a lot of support for that. Uh, and that support is also something we need to get through times like this. And again, what is our tendency is to pull back from that support. We got to run towards it, you know, connect, connect, sure. connect. people to, especially now when we can't go see people, right? So yeah. your tendency is to hold up and yeah, it's just easy now to avoid people because yeah. we're literally avoiding people. Yeah. But that's a yeah. tough one. You know, that's, there's, yeah. again, this, when we consider that our conditions are multiply caused, um, you know, you know, there, there's sometimes no easy answer or elegant, again, no elegant answer to some of the things that uh, uh, affect us. Now, before I ask the next, uh, ask you the next question, I just want to mention that this is being recorded, uh, yeah. that this will be on our website so people can listen to it again or forward uh, the link to people to our website so that they can see this. I was asked if we could get a copy of your slides and post them on the website. I, I don't know if you're mm -hmm. okay. That'd be great. So we'll make sure those are available yep. for everybody as well. So uh, you mentioned the bin Laden raid. And of course, when people hear that you were involved in it, they, they are interested. So one of my questions that it was, I'm getting, it's funny with the multimedia, I'm getting them emailed to me. I'm getting texts from of questions. I'm getting, you know, on the zoom questions, but so this was emailed to me by someone who's listening, who said, uh, before the mission, how confident that you would uh, were you that you would be successful? That oh, Osama bin Laden was there. That you'd get at it, that you would get to him. Um, what was the mindset going in? Do you, and I guess this might speak to the whole optimism bias that people have. Were you, as I think you've told me in the past, there were a number of times where you thought you knew where he was, but this time you felt more assured i think so and I'll, then i'll follow up with questions yeah. after that that's a, that's a good question that was there a lot of lessons learned from that um you know we there were two camps right the one camp that said hey this is just a, a, another mission uh, uh those camps were the bureaucrats who never had been on a mission uh versus the operator camp was uh, there were so many unknowns inside of pakistan you talk about uncertainties and uh you know some of the things we we're going to be forced to deal with that that uh, that we couldn't even predict uh, what you fall back then on is, again, this is mastery. We have been in, and you, you reframe. We've been in those situations before where bad things happen that we couldn't predict. And, and through this you know, mastery and relying on each other, we were able to extricate ourselves from, from some pretty nasty places. Um, so that was our camp. And, and um, what my job was in that is, is really the number two guy in the team was to set up these scenarios that had no clear cut answers to them. We only had a couple of weeks to train for it. Uh, so scenarios that were difficult with no clear cut answers uh, and see how the guys started to respond and think on their feet. And that's what they really started to do, which is, you know, you know we call that fluid intelligence, I would say, as a strength of the, of the SEAL teams, particularly the guys at the development group at that high level. Um, we had been on many a bin Laden raid, particularly in the early days of Afghanistan, where every tall guy with a white robe was bin Laden. Right. So <laughs> right. Uh, you yeah. know, it was, it was uh, aggravating and frustrating to say the least. Um, in this case, when I was read in, I was the, probably the, uh, one of the first seals read in. Um, and I went up to the lead analyst and said, okay, what have you done to disconfirm that it's him. You can confirm a bias all day long. The tall guy in the white robes is Bin Laden. That's your bias and you confirm it, right? So I said, what have you done to disconfirm it? And I thought I'd surprise her and stump her. Instead, she rolled out a laundry list of things that they had done, she and her team, to disconfirm that this was Bin Laden. And she couldn't. They failed. Uh, it came down to the fact 
uh, that this was either some eccentric Kuwaiti billionaire or it was Osama bin Laden. And there was some circumstantial uh, evidence that led us to believe that it was bin Laden. So uh, <clears throat> again, at that level, we were as close to certain as you can be that it was him. Uh, at the level of uh, the politicians involved, and those were the people in the president's cabinet for the most part, uh, didn't want to take the political risk. So when the president said, hey, what do we do? What do you think? Uh, and they went around that circle there and started with Leon Panetta saying, that's a 50-50 chance that it's him. He was the head of the CIA. It's his information that we had looked at. We all agreed was solid, but here's the head of the CIA saying 50-50. Uh, talk about courage, right? Um, and that Basically pattern, the buck. Yeah. Pass the buck. That pattern continued all the way around the table and people like to play politics. Well, Bob Gates is a Republican. He was the secretary of defense at the time. And he said the same thing, uh, to his credit though, after the mission, he said, Hey, I was wrong. Uh, and you know, that's, that, that takes a, you know, a, a, a good person to be able to admit that. But anyway, right. you know, we were convinced it was him. Uh, we didn't think the mission was going to go. Um, I didn't say anything when I was watching this happen. Uh, no courage on my part who did say something was that lead analyst, tiny diminutive little woman, young woman who stood up and said, it's him, sir. And here's how I know that her, you know, our boss's eyes are this big. Uh, and that didn't stop her at all. And this, you know, as I asked her afterwards, she felt uh, that she had much more of a connection to the 3000 people that died in, in the twin towers uh, than she did to her boss or her job. And that uh, concern led her to override that fear of what her boss might do to her. Right. So anyway, man, president went, uh, when the guys were leaving, you know, it's a sense that, uh, uh, it just a complete and utter calm, you know, um, yeah, you told me when you go on these missions that most of the time on the way you're sleeping, right? You guys yeah. are asleep. Back then it was still the, uh, you know, we still had the iPods. So, you know, guys listen to music and stuff like that yeah. and sleep, um, uh, you know, and, uh, so it's, it's calm and you, you reserve that energy for when you need it. Right. Mm. We all have routines. I go back to those routines. I put my kit on the same way every time. Never once did I vary. That was a routine I didn't have to think about, right? I say it almost called a superstition, right? But it's it's really a, yeah. it's a routine, <laughs> yeah. right? It's it like is a, a routine. It's like yeah. a sports, uh, you know, yeah. a, an athlete. Like who, the towels uh, and stuff. Yeah, it does something that, you know, they have to put on their, their skates, the same, yeah. lace them up the same way every time or something. But, mm -hmm. So uh, I already know the answer to this question because you and I have talked about it. But uh, obviously during that mission, one of the helicopters crashed. Uh, and um, when that happened, the question is, did you run scenarios for that ahead of time? I know the answer to that. And how did you deal with the stress of that happening? So I was fired. You know that. Uh, I was yes. fired early, within the first five minutes of, of the bin Laden raid when uh, I said, hey, don't. You know, I was read in and, and there was a guy, the senior guy involved was actually was a Navy SEAL. It was never hadn't been an operator in 30 years or whatever. Very much a politician who was the first SEAL. He was the head of all spe joint special operations at the time, which is crazy. Uh, but he was the first military guy read in and he came up with a plan on his own, which you, should, you know, it's, you, just, you just don't do There's that. There's a you problem right there. Own. There's a problem. So he, he found these helicopters that have been mothballed. Uh, never been tried, never been tested. And I just walked up and said, Hey, you know, don't use these helicopters. We got it from here. And he fired me. Uh, now in my, where I lived in, in, in the operator role, uh, inside of the development group, you know, that's commonplace. If you have something to say, you say it. Um, and we want to hear what you have to say because everybody's life is on the line. If you, if you like got a young a, kid on that one mission. Yeah, about. exactly. I got an idea, right? We listened to those things. Well, he didn't like that. He thought it was disrespectful and fired me. My boss then who was the commanding officer of the team said, Oh, well, if he's gone, I'm gone too. Um, it, something like that. But uh, so within the first few minutes, you know, the top guys from the, of the team were gone. I uh, know we were obviously rehired. Um, obviously, but we were that those helicopters were forced on us and every mission uh, training opportunity that we had, we, we practiced a downed helicopter scenario. We made those helicopter pilots auto rotate controlled crash landing into the deck uh, to the point where they get tired of doing it. And on the night when it happened, you were ready. It was ready. Yeah. Yeah. It, and this is an interesting question is how is the team, do you keep in touch with most of those team members yeah. and how are they all doing since then? 
Uh, everybody is doing for the most part well. It's here you see when you know when you this affects not just uh, military members but anybody that's worked a, a, a long time in a, in one place, right? There, you get a there's a bit of institutionalization that goes on. So some guys are coping. Most of the guys are retired that were on that mission at this point. Uh, some guys are coping very well with retirement. They've reinvented themselves. That's that notion of resiliency again. Others have it a tougher time. Uh, but you know, the network is strong. It's the brotherhood. Uh, we reach out together, you know, we were on text groups and, uh, you know, we, uh, get together as often as we can. Guys are spread out all over the United States, but, uh, we get together and it's a lot of encouragement that goes on. It's help in some cases where it's needed. Um, but yeah, we, we stay, we stay connected. That's great. Yeah. We have so many questions. I could, I, 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 honest to God, we could go on for another hour. I'm going to ask a few more. We're getting up near mm -hmm. an hour, although we still have 127 people who have stayed on out of, I think we're yeah, up right about on. 160. So we can, we'll go a little while longer. And as people drop off, we'll get the idea that they're tired. But um, just a few more here. Uh, I think this is a really good question from Russell Coy, who's out in Denver, Colorado. He says, so many of us are defined by our job. We are leaning into our strengths and are spending more time than ever at our job while at home. This is now my routine, and how do I break from that because it's becoming unhealthy, basically? That's a great realization right there. Boy, I, you know, I said the same thing. You know, I was going to have time to finish the book when this all kicked off, right? Um, and I'm spending more time on Zoom um, and with- We appreciate with, it. With, yeah, absolutely. It was my, my pleasure. Um, Nobody can tell you that, but you can tell yourself that. And you know, when it's time to say, hey, I need to make a change here. And again, this is the, the, the stress that's building up. We, we, uh, there are some cultural philosophers out there who would suggest that the signature malady of our time is our inability to say no. Uh, so practice it. You gotta sometimes you go. practice change saying that, no. Sometimes you have to change that routine. Because as you said, it's easy for us. Sometimes it's actually easiest to fall into a routine yeah. Even if it's a bad routine, right? Yeah. So, yeah. and that can mean that. Now, before we get on, I'm going to ask one more question. But before yeah. we do, because we are starting to lose a few people here, I just want to mention that, again, Dave has done this um, basically out of the goodness of his heart to give back to the community. And there's, during these trying times, we're not paying him to do this. And uh, we really do appreciate it. And to, to show Dave how much we appreciate it and to give back, uh, Rosenberg and Parker will be making a $5,000 donation to a charity that Dave has picked, which is called the World of Honor Fund. And Dave, why don't you tell everybody about the World of Honor Fund so that they know what it is. Word of before honor. you do yeah. that, I'm yeah. sorry, well, Word of Honor, I'm sorry, Word yeah. of Honor Fund. And before you do that, we're making a $5,000 donation and we will also match up to $5,000 any donation that any of our audience uh, donates today or, or in the future. So there's a link on our website, suretybond.com. You can go there and that will take you to the Word of Honor Fund where you can make a donation yourself. So I'd encourage you to do that. So Dave, why don't you tell us about the Word of Honor Fund? Word of Honor, yeah. So Word of Honor started in 2011. We lost uh, um, 22 SEALs when a helicopter was shot down in Afghanistan. Uh, August 6, 2011, it's become known as Extortion 17 was the name of the helicopter. Um, you know, and all of us as dads, when we leave home for those many months, we, we say to our kids, you know, we make promises, right? Hey, when I come home, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll play football, we'll go, you know, surfing, we'll go climbing, we'll go ride a bike, I'll take you to Disneyland, There's, you know, things like that, any number of different things we say. And, and when that helicopter went down, one of my teammates said, you know, oh my God, who's who's going to keep all of those promises that the dads made. And he was the one that started Word of Honor. And it was all about keeping that promise and sharing the experiences that uh, the dads loved, uh, even though they weren't here, but to share those experiences with those, those kids, the, the, the survivors, what we call our gold star kids. Um, and it's pretty cool, man. They, they do, uh, you know, if the, if, the, if the child, not just what the dad wants, but as the, as the kids grow older, it's what, what do they want to experience and word of honor is there for them to make that happen. You know, the, some of these are, you know, it's, there's football games involved and stuff like that. Those are the simple things. Uh, uh, you know, some of the kids really love race car driving uh, Indy 500. So the, you know, Indy 500 crew said, hey, come out, we'll, we'll show the kids the, everything that they ever wanted to see about the Indy cars. Uh, you know, some kids going on surf trips around the world uh, with some of the best surfers climbing that they do, these adventure type things, um, you know, uh, arts and crafts, dancing, you know, uh, of all of the things that their dads had said uh, or 
wanted to experience with them or watching them experience, uh, Word of Honor is made available to these kids. That's pretty cool. That's terrific. Yeah. And I know you mentioned to me that that plaque behind you, that a lot of those people that you mentioned, are those are all the call signs yeah. of the folks that were lost during your your time in the, in the series. Yeah. 2001 to 2012, when I retired, you know, 38 of my friends died. So that was when I retired. They said, hey, what do you want as a gift? You know, and it was customary to give a guy a shotgun or a surfboard or something like that. And I, I said, no, I, I want the, the call sign patches of my teammates. Uh, and my, you know, my teammates initially said, well, that's, we can't do that. So it's morbid. And I said, well, you asked me what I wanted and that's what I want. Uh, and I expect it to be some small thing with their call sign patches in there. What is behind me is just beautiful. It's 38 call sign patches with the engraving of the memorial wall that is at the development group. Uh, and then with all their names on it as well. So it's a powerful thing. It hangs in my office. It's the only thing I have hanging from my career. And uh, it's something I see every day. Well, I think that's a good note to end it on. So uh, I want to, again, we could go on. I've got so many questions here, but I think we'll, it's been in exactly an hour. So I think we're in, in, uh, it's a good time to call it. And I want to thank you so much for participating. I know that it, just by the number of people who stayed on for the entire <clears> time, I know that everybody really appreciated. I really appreciate, uh, I, I've really enjoyed working with you, of course, as you know, over the past year or two. And, uh, and I really appreciate you taking the time to yeah. um, just to share your knowledge and expertise and uh, stories with, uh, with our colleagues and our friends from uh, from all over. So thanks, Dave. Everybody out there, have a, a wonderful weekend and a, and a great Friday night. And be safe, be well. And we will be doing a few more uh, uh, webinars over the coming weeks. So keep a lookout for that. And we hope you'll come back and see us there. So um, thank you very much. And take care, everybody.